Welcome to morning worship at Somerset First United Methodist Church as we gather together today to praise our wonderful and loving Father. We, uh, we are so glad to have you with us. If you're a guest with us, we especially welcome you this morning and invite you to just join right in with us as we worship together. We're going to begin this way 
simply by asking you, if you would, to stand and greet those around you with the love of Christ. Would you do that? Just speak to someone you've not yet spoken to and greet them with the love of Christ. As you come back to your seats, we're going to continue on with a couple of songs. If you, it is well, uh, if you'll uh, open up your hymnals and turn to page 154, we're going to sing the first four verses of "All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name" together. It's page 154. We're going to stand and sing the first four verses. to page 98. We're going to sing also together, To God Be the Glory. It's on page 98. When we, uh, the choir was working through this earlier, and I noticed there's a couple phrases in here that we sometimes either take for granted or just don't always quite understand, like um, the son who yielded his life and atonement for sin. I think sometimes, even as Christians, those of us that believe, we kind of forget what is sin, so just for a moment, Paul says, 
my thing would work. Uh, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension and division, envy and drunkenness. We sometimes think of sin as being, oh, you know, that's really bad stuff. But I haven't murdered anyone recently, so I'm doing pretty well. But if at any time you've had any of those in you, even quarreling and hostility, that's sin right there. And today we're talking about salvation, which is God saving us from that, keeping us from those things and moving us to a new way of life. We're going to sing to God be the glory, and we're singing about the, the God, and we're giving him glory because of what he's done, because of the fact that we are sinful. We've done bad things, but he saved us from them. So let's sing together, To God Be the Glory.
Would you bow with me for me? I just feel the urge to pray right here. Father, we bow head and heart before you. So grateful for the gift of Jesus, your son. He went to Calvary and died on the cross and paid the price for our sins. And in him, we have life and life abundant. We thank you, God, for being the kind of wonderful God who would love us so much. You care so much about us. You know us. You know us to the deepest point of our knowing. The Bible tells us that even the hairs on our heads are numbered. You know us so well. We are created by your hand and loved by you. Today, as we worship Father... We're here to give you honor and praise and glory, and to do that through the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And it's in his precious name we pray. Amen. Now, you can be seated. Thank you. I'm going to do something a little different. I'm going to change the order of things for a minute. Is that all right? Okay. I'm going to change the order of things, and we're going to ask Vicki, if she would, to come and share the time with the children. After that, Henry, are you going to do the update? All right, we'll ask you right after, after Vicki gets through to come and do that. So, young people, if you're here, come on down front and join Miss Vicki. She'd be glad to have you. You're going to be amazed at what she shows you today. You want to to sit that right up here where everybody can see it better? Sure. Can I do it without spilling it? Don't guarantee that. Nevaeh, are you not going to join me? All right. Vicki's got something she wants to show everybody. All right. I'm putting an apron on today. That's because I don't trust myself. You got it? Okay. I got to turn these around so you guys can see them. What does this one say? How about this one? What does this one say? (gasps) Are they the same? Which one's different? The orange one. Hmm. Looks kind of... What is that? What do you think it is? Maybe oil. That's a good guess. It's representing sin. Now, when God made Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden... (laughs) Could be apple juice... (gasps) They were perfect. They loved God. They walked with God. They talked with God. And everything was good. They didn't even know what it meant to do anything wrong. They didn't even, couldn't even think about doing something bad. They were beautiful and clear. Their life had no sin, no nothing. And God walked with them every day. They got to see God face to face. And they talked with him. And you can see that they were made in the image of God. But who can tell me what happened? God pushed it out of the way. What happened in the garden? Mm-hmm. She's exactly right. Man. There was only one thing, one rule. God said, please don't eat that. Please don't eat of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because in the day you do, something bad will happen. Well, they didn't know what bad was. But she's right. The devil came along and they said, Mm-mm-mm. you should eat this. And they did. And sin is now inside Adam and Eve. And because of them, it became inside of all of us. But, you know what? God didn't stop loving them. And he was sad and he wanted to talk to them and walk with them again. And he said, one day, I myself will come. And we will make it right. And so, God sent himself in the Son, Jesus Christ. And he died on the cross. And his blood cleanses us from all, all right. sin. Yeah. 
And now we are right with God through the blood of Jesus. And we can talk to him. And when we ask him in our heart, he walks with us daily. Isn't that awesome? That God made a way. Let's pray. Oh, man, God. We are so sorry that we sin. Please forgive us. And please come into our heart and clear up the sin and make us right with you again. And we give you the thanks and the praise. In Jesus' great name, amen. Amen. All right, young people, you can go to Children's Church. Let's give them a hand. Let's give them a wonderful... Oh, it's good to see all of you. I see, that's my fault. <laughs> Henry's going to share with us a Church Without Walls update. I know that we just came out of the Christmas season, but guess what? We're going to talk about Operation Christmas Child again. Um, Vicki had so much to do that I've taken over uh, the Operation Christmas Child. And this month, which there's only two more days left, we're collecting hats and gloves and scarves for the boxes that we're going to put together in November. But I thought you would like an update, <clears throat> excuse me, about the boxes we collected last year. And I misspoke in the first service. This was just in the United States, the boxes collected. <laughs> There was 11,485,622 boxes collected nationwide. This church, we collected 110 boxes, and through the tracking system, we found out where our boxes went to. They went to South Africa. So 110 children had a Christmas in South Africa because of the efforts of this church. So I just wanted to give you an update, and next month we're going to be collecting toothbrushes and dental floss. Um, when it gets closer to November, I'll ask for toothpaste, but if you didn't know it or not, but toothpaste does have an expiration date on it. So we don't want any toothpaste yet, but we will take toothbrushes and dental floss. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Thank you. You know, it's one thing to be a follower of Christ, it's another thing to be willing to share that with someone. And uh, I, I'm convinced and convicted that every Christian is called on to share their love for Christ with others in some way. Whether it's in the way we act, or the way we speak, what we say, what we do, some way we need to share and convey that love. It's so important. Let me give you a reason why. This morning in the early service, we were visited by a sweet lady named Patricia who's sitting right down front here. I'm not going to embarrass you, Patricia, I promise you. Patricia shared with us as we were having testimonies of salvation that she was raised in a home where uh, it was a dysfunctional home and uh, her dad followed Muhammad and, and Jehovah and Jehovah Witness and, and a lot of different influences in her life. She came to us this morning and said, you know, I've just picked up the Bible and started reading it. And God is speaking to my heart. I don't know much about faith. And I don't know much about God. But I said to her, if you'll just hang around after service, we've got some folks who want to speak with you. And they spoke with her. And she accepted Christ this morning. Now she's a, she's a, a baby Christian. And we... You know, we're all going to need to help her and pray for her and, and give God thanks for bringing her to us that we can make a difference in her life. You never know, folks, when you're making a difference. We all need to be willing to do that. So I'm going to ask for a testimony right now of one person, just one person to stand up as a Christian and say the difference that Jesus has made in your life since you became a Christian. Is there one person here this morning that would be willing to say, the difference that Christ has made in you. Just in a brief word. Anyone? I'm going to give you a chance. Not everybody at one time. <laughs> well, I will. All right. <laughs> uh, I, I just, I can't imagine not having God in my life. 
I was raised in a Christian home, so as I told you before, I have no excuses. Um, but there's always times in your life when you wax and wane, and you're back and forth, and sometimes your faith is a little stronger than others. That's certainly true for me. But the Lord has brought me through a couple of experiences in my life that weren't pleasant. But, and even at the time, I wasn't sure how I was getting through it, but when I looked back, I knew how. So I, I just, without God in my life or being a Christian, I just wouldn't see much reason in being here. So I'm thankful that he is there, and I'm thankful for you all as my church family that support me and forgive me mm-hmm. for lots of things. Amen. Amen. Anyone else want to speak? Oh, I see a hand. <laughs> Excuse me, I have to honor this hand right here. (laughs) I gave my heart to the Lord when I was 12 years old. I was in a very dysfunctional home, and what it had done for me was it gave me the Lord. Well, I was raised a Catholic, so it was a very religious setting that I was raised in, but it never touched my heart. It never changed me. And because of the dysfunction in my home, I had two brothers and a sister, and they're all gone. They've passed away. But because I chose to live for the Lord, I believe that he put his hand upon my life and gave me wisdom and guided me and filled me with his spirit so that I could walk with him and be a testimony today that you could be delivered and set free and come out of anything that this life has to throw you. Amen. Amen. It's important to share what Christ has done for us and the difference that he's making in our hearts and lives. We're talking today about salvation. Hopefully we'll get down to the nitty-gritty of it and talk about it in a way that uh, we can all understand. So the choir is going to sing for us a beautiful song during this time of offering this morning. We're going to worship God with the offering. And as we are worshiping with this offering, think about the way that Christ is real to you and the difference through his wonderful power that he's making in your life. If I can have four people who will assist us as ushers, we'll worship God with the morning offering. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come before you now in this time of offering and acknowledge that you are a wonderful Father, a wonderful God. Jesus said we could call you Daddy. We could call you Father. That's how much you love us. That's the way, the intimacy that you want with us. We praise you today and acknowledge your wonderful blessings on our lives as we bring this offering today, Father. We do with glad and grateful hearts We just ask that as you receive it, that you'd receive us. Use us for your kingdom's sake. Lord, use this church. Motivate us and inspire us by your spirit to be the church that you're calling us to be. In Christ's precious name, amen. touch of mercy for anyone who suffered long enough just come to the river of redemption you'll find wonder working power in the blood there's still wonder working power in the blood of Calvary every day and every us free and it's strong enough today to wash sin away in that never ending soul cleansing flood there's still wonder working power in the blood for every time the 
tempter tries to bind you For every time you stumble and give up Praise God there's still a fountain of forgiveness And there's still wonder-working power in the blood There's still wonder-working power in the blood of Calvary Every day and every hour it still flows to make us free And it's strong enough today to wash sin away In that never-ending soul-cleansing flood There's still wonder-working power in the blood There's still power Thank you. Please be seated. Here is our scripture for today. It is the key verse of scripture for this past week in our reading in Believe. As a church, we are reading this book and studying the book together. Here's our key verse. It's from Ephesians. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 2, verse eight and, verses 8 and 9. And I know that many of you can say it by heart, right? It goes like this. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be God. to God. Are you familiar with the Four Dummies series of books? They're a series of books started a few years ago. I think the first one was started to explain a particular computer program in simple terms so people could get hold of it and understand it. Now there are absolutely thousands of, of different uh, issues of Four Dummies book, books. They have them covering every kind of topic. For instance, I have a Fishing for Dummies book that I particularly enjoy. You can get them that cover, like, uh, there's Shakespeare for dummies. There is uh, workouts for dummies. There is camping for dummies. I found this interesting. There's one called weddings for dummies, and there's one called divorce for dummies. 
There's even one called ATMs for dummies. And with the luck that I've had at some ATMs, I could probably need to read that. In our home, I have a sort of recording studio, a home recording studio, and so I have a copy of Home Recording for Dummies. And it really does help because it explains in layman's terms a lot of the terms that they use in recording. Now, I want to talk for a few moments this morning about salvation for dummies. Now, I'm not talking that, saying that we're all dummies. That's not what it is. But here's what I'm saying. Salvation is so important. Let's see if we can get down to the nitty-gritty of it. Sometimes in the church, and we preachers are guilty of this, sometimes in the church we talk things to death without ever really saying what they are. It's kind of like a story I heard about four men who were all admiring a beautiful apple on a table. They were all looking at this apple, and they were talking about what this apple said to them about God. One of them said, I want you to look. Just look at how the sunlight's coming through the window and hitting the skin of this apple. Look how beautiful it's glowing. Can you see the deep reds and it moves into lighter shades of red and then, and then yellows and, and even a streak of green in this beautiful apple, the apple skin? It just tells me of the beauty of God. It speaks volumes to me about the beauty of God. The other fellow stand there and he said, you know, this apple came from an apple tree that came from a tiny seed. One tiny seed, and it grew into a great apple tree, put forth fruit, and now we have this beautiful apple as a result. And it just tells me of the grandeur and the creativity of God, how God could take a tiny seed to bring forth fruit. The third man had listened to them, and he stood there, and he said, You know, as I look at this apple, it tells me about God. It says, You can take this apple, and you can, fr from this apple, you can make apple juice. And from this apple, you can make apple sauce. And from this beautiful apple, you can make an apple pie. And it just tells me that God is a God of great variety. Marvelous God. The fourth fellow had been standing there all the time listening to this. Suddenly, he reached for the apple and took a great big bite. <laughs> they all stepped back and said, wait, what did, what did God tell you about, the bio, about this apple? And the guy said, God said to me, hungry? Well, here's an apple. <laughs> Salvation is at the heart of every Christian. Salvation is at the heart of our faith. Salvation is at the heart of life. So let's talk about it a minute. Years ago, I learned a simple presentation of the gospel called the Romans Road. Four stops along that road. Maybe you've, you've heard it. Maybe you've shared it with someone. Stop one says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And it comes from Romans chapter 3, verse 23, where Paul says we are all sinners. We've all sinned. We all fall short of what God intended for us. Is there any debate over that? Didn't think so. Stop two says, The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So right away, right away, Paul tells us, look, sin is going to kill you. But the gift of everlasting and eternal life is in Jesus. Then stop three says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now look, that's Romans 5, verse 8. Not only are we all sinners... But here's how God shared his love for us. Sin was going to kill us. God knew it. It was going to separate us from him eternally. And so God sent his son. And while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Wow. And that brings us to stop forward. And that's where I want to talk for just a moment this morning. And here's what I, the way I want to begin. I want to ask you a question. This is a multiple choice question. I want you to answer this question. I'll give you the choices. Here's the question. How good do you have to be to go to heaven? How good do you have to be to go to heaven? Now, here are your choices. A, pretty good. B, really good. C, better than Uncle Joe. And D, perfect. Now, how would you answer that? 
The answer is D. If you want to go to heaven, you've got to be perfect. I'm sorry, but that's where it is. If you want to go to heaven, you have to be perfect. And I don't mean sort of perfect. I don't mean 80% perfect. Being 80% perfect would be like being 80% pregnant. There's no such thing. You can't be 80% perfect. And the kicker is this, most everybody, when you ask them this question, how good do you have to be to go to heaven, they're either going to answer it with A, which is pretty good, B, which is really good, or C, better than the guy down the street. But that's not what God says. That's not the answer God gives us. God demands perfection. You see, I know that's a shocking thought, but we live in an imperfect world in the very state of perfection. The whole idea of perfection is hard for us to grasp. If you ask people, do you have to be perfect to go to heaven? They're going to say, no, probably not. And here's why. You see, they're believing that if when it comes to that final time and they're standing before God in the judgment, they'll be able to say to God, but look here, I was not so bad. I tried as hard as I could. I tried the best that I could. I'm not nearly as bad as some of those other people in the world. So God, take that into consideration and God will say, I'm sorry. Now I'm just going to share it like it is. I'm sorry. God will say, that won't work here. You see, God who is perfect does not let anything imperfect into heaven. So if we can't be perfect on our own, and we can't, what are we to do? What can we do? Well, the answer is we have to find someone to be perfect for us. Since I can't be perfect enough, Someone has to be perfect for me. And that's what Paul is telling us in our scripture from Romans that I shared. Paul is saying, guess what? God sent someone for you. He is perfect. Jesus was perfect. Jesus was sent for us to be perfection for us. Jesus paid the ransom for us. Jesus died for us. Have you ever heard that? Sure you have. We've all heard it many times. We've read it. We've studied it. We even try our best to believe it. But there's something about us that won't turn loose this idea that, you know, if I try hard enough, I can make it on my own. If I try hard enough, God will see that I'm good enough to make it into heaven. Reminds me of a story I heard about this man. He was an eccentric millionaire, billionaire, really. And so he offered a million dollars to anyone who could swim from San Diego, California to Honolulu, Hawaii. A million dollars. Now, that's 2,500 miles. The rules were real simple. You couldn't have any help, no mechanical help. No one could help you. You couldn't stop. You couldn't rest. You had to swim 2,500 miles nonstop. You'd get a million dollars. Well, nobody took him up, of course. So he said, I'll tell you what, I'll up it to $10 million. Still no takers. So this guy said, I tell you what I'll do. I'll give a hundred million dollars to anybody who can swim from San Diego, California to the shore of Honolulu, Hawaii. 10,000 people showed up on the day it was to happen. 10,000. The gun sounded. Everybody went into the water. A few people turned back after about 200 yards because they really couldn't swim. They just thought, well, you know, you never know. A few others dropped out after five miles because they'd been bitten by sharks. 
Still others, about 10 miles out, got tangled in seaweed and had to stop. At the 20-mile mark, out of 10,000 contestants, 150 were left. By the 50-mile mark, 10 were left. Five others dropped out in the next 30 miles, and at the 100-mile mark, there were two swimmers left, two, and they were both Olympic swimmers, distance swimmers in the Olympics. At 150 miles, there was only one swimmer left. She had won two gold medals in distance swimming in the Olympics. She made it to 215 miles before she gave up. When they pulled her into the boat in which the rich man was on board, she told the rich man, she said, I deserve the money because I swam farther than anybody. And the rich man said, no. And she said, well, then I at least deserve a portion of the money for giving it the best try. And the rich man said, no, it's all or nothing. He said to her, I don't care if you'd gotten within a hundred yards of the beach at Honolulu. If you'd stopped right there, it'd been nothing. The same is true in the spiritual realm when it comes to God. Suppose a person could end up somehow being perfect enough to get within six inches of heaven Will God let them in? No. You're either in or you're out. Being inside is all that matters. When I was a kid, I learned this saying, and it's true when it comes to salvation. Close only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. Being close to being a Christian does not work. What's at stake? Well, let me see if I can explain. This is where it gets tough. Nobody wants to hear this. You know that song, Amazing Grace? You know that verse in Amazing Grace where we sing, When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun. We've no less days to sing. I love that verse. Sometimes I wish somebody had written the opposite verse to talk about hell. You see, there's a verse for hell. When we've been there 10,000 years and the flames are licking up over our ears, there's no hope. You see, Jesus talked more about hell than he ever did about heaven, and there's a reason why. Hell is real. And hell is for eternity. Now, what does that mean? Well, I don't know. You and I can't really grasp it, but I'll give you my best shot. When you've been there and been there and been there in hell, you'll still be there. There will be no dying and getting out of it. You know, I don't care what kind of bad shape you get in in this world. You can die and get out of it. Not in eternity. There's no ending to it. So when you've been there 10,000 years, you've only just begun. And here's what Jesus said about it. He said, it's a place of fire. It's a place of torment. It's a place of desperation. It's a place of anguish. And the worst thing about it is that you're cut off from God. You can call out for God, scream out for God, pray to God, do all you want to for God, and he won't hear you. Now, we don't want to talk about that. Used to be that was preached a lot. It's not preached much anymore. We have become heaven people. We believe on the goodness of God. We believe that God is somehow going to bend the rules and grade on a curve. But that's not going to work. Oh, come on, preacher, you know. Come on. If I try my best and, and, and try to follow Christ and try to do my best, but you know, I'm not living like I know I should, but you know, I'm going to get by. God's going to, he's going to say to me on that last day, you know, I know you were trying. You 
No. It doesn't work that way. God said there's one way. And it comes through my son. And it cost his blood. And until you're covered with his blood, you're not going to make it. I heard a story about a young man, about 14, 15 years of age. He was, this is a long time ago. He was caught, he was in a gambling thing with some guys. He was gambling and he got mad and, and somehow he pulled a gun or pulled a knife. I can't remember, but he killed a man. So they arrested him. And back in those days, when you killed somebody, you hung for it. The people of the town came to the judge. They, they signed this petition. They came to the judge and said, Your Honor, he's such a young man, and he's got his whole life ahead of him. We know you're going to sentence him to be, to be hanged. And, 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 Your Honor, we all want to go out on his behalf and say, Look, we'll take care of him. If you'll, if you'll pardon him, we'll take care of him. We'll try to raise him right. And so the judge was moved by what they said, and he said, all right, I'll do that. I'll pardon him, but I've got one condition. I'm going to dress up in the robe of a clergyman, and I'm going to take the Bible and put it in my hand, and I'm going to place his pardon in this Bible, and I'm going to go talk to him in prison. And so that's what he did. The judge went into the cell block, and the young man saw him coming, and he started yelling and cursing, Preacher, I don't have, I don't have any need for you. I don't want to hear none of your junk. Just get out of here and let me alone. And the judge who was dressed as the minister said, Son, I can help you. Won't you let me help you? Let me explain to you how you can be pardoned. And he said, I don't want it. I don't want anything you've got. So the judge left, very dejected, left. In a little while, the jailer said to the young man, Do you know who that was? That was the judge. And in the Bible he carried was a pardon for your life. When they brought the young man to the gallows, just before they put the black hood over his face, they said, do you have anything you want to say? Here's what he said. I'm not being hung today because I killed a man. I'm being hung today because I refuse the pardon. No one is going to hell because God sends them there. God sends nobody to hell. We send ourselves. Every person who ends up in eternity in hell will be there Because they refused the pardon. Not for what they did, but because they refused the pardon. Years ago, a friend of mine penned the words to a wonderful song. He wrote, I should have been crucified. I should have suffered and died. I should have hung on the cross in disgrace. But Jesus, God's Son, took my place. That pardon is extended to everybody here. Only you and God know if you're trying to get by on your own. But if you, are, if you are trying to get by on your own, hear me, you are not going to make it. It won't work. There's only one way. And that way is Jesus. And you have to turn from your sins and say, Lord, I am sorry for the sin of my life. I realize that I can't save myself. So I'm turning to you. And I ask you, Jesus, to come into my heart and into my life and become Savior and Lord of me. Accept the pardon. And you'll be free.
to live not only this life, but the life that is to come in joy and in peace and in love. Amen? Amen. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you again today for speaking to our hearts. Each one of us has our own decision to make when it comes to accepting Christ. For those of us today who are relying on our own goodness, we thank you for trying to meet us where we are. May we, may we realize how lost we are without you and come in faith to you through Jesus Christ. You have given us a way of salvation. It is a marvelous gift. Ours to accept. Even now. Today. In Jesus name. Amen. We're going to sing a wonderful hymn. 370 in the hymnal. We're going to sing victory in Jesus. And you have that victory if you've accepted Christ as Lord and Savior. And you can stand and really sing it. If you don't know him, my friend, I would love to talk with you about Jesus. I'd love to pray with you that you might come to know Christ in your heart. You can come today. The altar is open. You can repent where you are and give your life to Christ. That salvation is yours and it's extended freely to you today. If you'll accept it in Christ's name, then you too can know the victory. Let's stand and sing it. Come on, we want you folks who know the Christ and the salvation he brings to sing like it. Amen. Amen. Victory in Jesus.
people of grace and we are people of peace and we are people of love set free from sin by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and his love for us that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us we have one more thing to do and that is to go forward from this place and live like it go in his name amen